afternoon. In about 10 minutes, I want to step back a little bit and give you a broader view of what is happening uh, in AI and some imperatives that we face as we think about the future of Britain, but also of, of the world ahead of us. When Tony asked me to do this talk, I reflected on more than 35 years of uh, being associated with AI. Um, these two gentlemen were the fathers of AI. John McCarthy came up with the name artificial intelligence back in 1956. He was also the head of my uh, qualifying exam committee in my PhD studies. And Marvin wrote my recommendation letter that got me into Stanford. Um, more recently, I um, was involved in OpenAI um, at the very beginning, back in, 19, uh, back in 2015. And uh, so I have been around several uh, waves of AI. Back when I did my PhD, we used to call that the AI winter. Uh, and in fact, uh, every successful technique used to quickly detach itself from AI and come up with a different name for it. Um, and of course, what you have all seen what has happened uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so, and especially in the last seven months. So what is it? And I'm going to try to do something crazy and give you a two minute overview of what it is, because I believe, I deeply believe that when we understand something, we lose the fear of it, we demystify it. Modern AI, especially the last 10 years or so, um, has been based on a technique called neural networks, deep neural networks. Um, they are modeled after the, the, that's a human nerve cell over there, um, neuron, that's where the word neural network comes from. We have about, give or take, 80 billion of these, John, in our bodies. Um, and you can see the synapses around the neuron there. One neuron typically connects up to 10,000 other neurons, so we have about 250 or so trillion synapses in us. Um, and so when neural networks, artificial neural networks started, on the right here I have a picture of a, um, um, a credit scoring neural network that was used in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, it would take four parameters as input. You can see those income, job duration, current debt, and the amount of loan that was being asked for. Uh, this was widely used. It has, as you can see, 10 neurons in there. And it would basically spit out the credit risk of that particular person. And the way these things get trained, you start with a random a bunch of numbers. And obviously, in the beginning, this is all wrong. Uh, but you take the difference between what the answer should have been from the data that you have uh, and what the answer was calculated as. And you back propagate that through the network. And by doing this millions of times, this bunch of numbers somehow miraculously figures out how to assess a person's credit risk. Fast forward to today, so that was a 10 neuron neural network. Today, chat GPT, we don't know how many chat GPT has, GPT-4. It has uh, almost certainly more than a trillion parameters inside it. There were some accounts recently that it has about 1.6 trillion parameters. So you don't have credit histories to train this on. You train this on amo massive amounts of text. Uh, and you get it to predict the next word, and that acts as a way to label the data, to train the data. And <clears throat> in the end, when you ask ChatGPT a question like, who was Barack Obama's father? It is not actually answering the question, who was Barack Obama's father? It is predicting the next word after that, and the word after that, and the word after that, and so on. And this behavior, obviously, it is incredibly impressive. A lot of people ask me, did there are, you know, experts on one side who think that this act of predicting sequences of words one after the other is indeed intelligence. And then there are those equally distinguished experts who say this is all nonsense. Uh, and people ask me which side am I on and my answer is why don't you learn about this yourself um, and uh, come up with your own answer. The, um, up there, uh, this whole revolution that led to ChatGPT started about five years ago. Um, a system called BERT was built based on transformer technology coming out of Google. It had 108 million parameters, which at the time thought was insanely large. Um, very quickly, people realized that the bigger you make these networks, uh, the more powerful they seem to get. Um, and as you see, today we have a trillion plus parameter networks. The computing story underneath that, that's the chart down below, 
is simply astonishing. We are approaching 60 years of Moore's law of doubling computing power every two years. In the current AI world of these GPUs, it is even faster than doubling every two years. Last year, NVIDIA released their most powerful H100 GPU, which has uh, a performance of 67 teraflops. One GPU about that size, um, 67 uh, teraflops, that's trillion floating point operations. And then there was March of last year, May of this year, they released the subsequent version, the GH200, the Grace Hopper 200, and that is about four times as powerful. So, but the most stunning, if you think about the scale of change in AI, the most stunning numbers that I, uh, up there I have uh, uh, AlexNet, the computer vision network that broke open this field 10 years ago, is now not even the top, in the top 300 computer vision systems. There are more than 300 systems that are more accurate, more powerful than AlexNet was. So the, the scale of change here is, is hard to uh, comprehend. But the most stunning numbers are the ones inside this yellowish box. Um, out of 8 billion people on the planet, um, by my estimation, there are roughly, uh, there are less than 2 million who uh, understand, who can build you an AI system. Application builders, people who could build you a model for something or build you an application for something. Less than 2 million. It's probably closer to 1.5 million. Uh, so that is far less than 1% of the people. Um, only about 200,000 um, know how to operate an AI system. Um, ML engineers, machine learning operations people, less than 200,000 out of 8 billion. Um, the number of people who could explain to you how ChatGPT works is less than 50,000. So this has to change. What can this stuff do? Sal talked about education, Priya talked about education. Um, there are massive applications of this from generating images to writing essays and poetry, um, writing source code software. It's astonishingly good at writing software. It's, um, one thing that was surprising to me, um, despite having been involved in this since the beginning, is how good it is at writing software. Um, in my world, in the world of enterprise AI, these are just a list of applications in businesses that my company has seen. Um, so it can clearly do a lot. It also has uh, incredibly powerful negative consequences. Um, Sal talked about the fact that on the whole it is positive. Um, perhaps he's right. The, uh, the danger, so on the left here, uh, I'm on the advisory board of Stanford's AI Center. And that's a yearly report that we write. Um, this year's report, 36% uh, of the people in the NLP research community, these are not ordinary citizens. These are people who do research in natural language. 36% of them believe that, um, that AI decisions can lead to nuclear level catastrophes. Um, and we have many examples of accidents and all of these things that have happened. Um, the danger I see is not so much that this stuff is intelligent. The danger is that uh, extraordinarily harmful things can be done with it very, very quickly. Uh, and I think that is something that we all need to, uh, uh, to be aware of. So when you have something that is that powerful, that potentially damaging, what should we do? How should we think about this? Clearly, we have to come up with regulation. When we regulate cigarettes, we regulate seat belts in cars, we regulate toilet flushes, we have to regulate this stuff. Um, China has come up with perhaps one of the first major generative AI policies. It's, a, it's an extremely well-written policy. And despite the differences that the West has with China on all kinds of fronts, it behooves us to look at what this policy is and how they have written it. Uh, on the 15th of August, it will go into effect in China. It's a, one of the first major countries that has done it. Um, I won't get into it in more detail except to say that uh, the governments around the world uh, and here in the UK have to come up with ways to regulate this, uh, come up with guardrails uh, around this. Um, 
Tony very strongly believes in improving efficiency of the government using AI. Obviously, the applications that you see in enterprises apply to governments um, all across the government in working more effectively. But there is an even more important reason than improving the efficiency. Um, and that is that Richard Feynman used to say that what I don't build, I cannot understand. When you build AI, when you use AI within the government, the government will become more comfortable with it, more familiar with it. And that brings us back to the issue of education and access. And I think this is the most important priority. Regulation is the most urgent priority, but education and access to people is the most important priority in AI. Um, Alan Kay once told me about the difference between making a living and making a life and how making a life is a much bigger and much more important idea than making a living. I think, I think we will all stumble into helping people make a living in the time of AI, but I think we really ought to think about um, how we might help everyone make a life, and not just an AI life, but making our lives. Thank you.